after exploding seven atomic bombs at Maralinga, Britain conducted a series of 15 trials codenamed Vixen B at the site. In those trials, a nuclear bomb was placed on a large steel structure known as a feather bed, erected on a concrete firing pad. The feather bed was some five metres high and was basically a platform and a back wall. The bomb was detonated in a manner which prevented a nuclear explosion, but the chemical explosion melted the bomb core and threw plutonium and uranium up to a kilometre into the air. The wind then carried the toxic cloud many kilometres across the landscape. The result was plutonium contamination in three fingers, generally to the northwest, north and northeast. The area within the blue line of this diagram is contaminated above the criteria for cleaning the site. The explosion damaged the feather bed so much that it could not be used a second time. So each one was buried in a pit close to the firing pad, but the inner pits were too small to take the walls of the feather beds, and so other pits were excavated in other parts of the site. After those trials, Britain moved their bomb development to joint facilities in the USA and left Maralinga. Before leaving, Britain conducted a final clean-up in 1967, codenamed Operation Brumby. They spread clean soil over the worst contamination and ploughed a large surrounding area to dilute the radioactivity, and they cast concrete caps over the pits containing the remains of the feather beds. Australia accepted Britain's assurance that the site was clean and release them from any further responsibility. In 1984, the Australian government made its own inquiry and found the site was far from satisfactory. Further work would be necessary before the site could be returned to the traditional owners. In 1989, I prepared cost estimates for several options for the proposed clean-up. One option was agreed between the Federal Government, the South Australian Government and the traditional owners. The most contaminated soil would be collected and buried in a large trench and the debris pits would be treated by a process of in situ vitrification. Small scale ISV equipment was manufactured and taken to Maralinga for preliminary tests. The results were checked by scientists at ANSTO and pronounced satisfactory. The department then signed a contract for the full-size equipment to be manufactured and used to treat the 21 debris pits, but they forgot to include a statement of what had to be achieved. These are samples from the final two trial melts. The darker block contains both plutonium and uranium. The others contain only uranium. I was with a group of Aboriginal elders one day and to show my faith in the effectiveness of vitrification and to demonstrate its safety, I proceeded to lick a smaller sample which contained plutonium. Meanwhile, a very large trench measuring 205 metres long by 140 metres wide by 15 metres deep was excavated close to the contaminated area. The spoil from the excavation was put aside to be used later. 330,000 cubic metres of contaminated soil were transferred to the trench and that soil contained an estimated 3.3 kilograms of plutonium, which is represented by this block of wood. So there really is no problem with the simple burial of the contaminated soil, 
because the radioactivity was widely dispersed and therefore very low. The area from which soil was removed is shown in this diagram. The area marked in red was about 1.6 square kilometres, about 1% of the area above the criteria. The trench was then covered with about 3 metres of the spoil from the trench excavation. Two main problems were encountered in the soil removal. One was the amount of dust raised which simply blew away. The problem was never really resolved at Taranaki, but with a change in procedure, dust suppression was excellent at the other two sites, TM and Wewak. The second problem was removing the final particles of plutonium in order to meet the clean-up criteria. In the end, it all came down to a man with a pick and a roadside vacuum cleaner. By such perseverance, the workers met the clearance criteria and achieved a staggering 3,000-fold decrease in the level of contamination. As the soil was scraped away from around the concrete caps covering the 21 debris pits, tons of contaminated debris were uncovered. None of the caps covered the entire pit. Two caps were several metres from the pits they were supposed to cover. I guess there was three times more debris than we had been led to believe, so vitrification of the pits was going to cost more, and this led to the silliest conversation I have ever had to endure. I was at Marolinga and telephoned the department in Canberra to report the amount of debris and said we would need a revised cost estimate for the work. Back came a question, how do you know it's debris? Because I've seen it, I replied. Yes, but how do you know it's debris? Because I've seen it, I repeated. And then a third time, yes, but how do you know it's debris? because I've seen it, filmed it and photographed it. It's debris. And the response from Canberra? Well, we'll have to think of another way of treating it to save money. Perhaps pile it up in the centre. I then had to explain it is the amount of debris to be treated that determines the cost, not how it is piled. As the work progressed, there were two major changes in the project management. First was a change of staff in the government department and the other was when the project management company was taken over by another company. Neither should have made any difference but both had a major influence on the outcome. When the soil removal was complete the department extended the contract with the project manager so that they would also manage the vitrification. They did this in full knowledge of the fact that the company had not been involved in the development of the complex process and had never even seen the full-size equipment. As soon as they were appointed, the project manager suggested that they should simply exhume the 21 pits and bury the debris in a deeper trench. This was the sort of suggestion you could expect from somebody with no nuclear experience. They put their proposal in writing with the statement The recent consideration of alternative treatments for ISV for these outer pits has arisen as a result of the revised estimate for ISV being considerably above the project budget. Incredibly, the department accepted the suggestion even though their own advisory committee had recommended vitrification as a far superior option. Clearly they were more interested in cutting the cost than in the proper disposal of a long-lived radioactive substance such as plutonium. The department then changed the plan and opted for a hybrid solution neither one thing nor the other. Vitrification of the inner pits would continue, but the outer pits would be exhumed and the contents buried in a single large trench. The strange thing is that the outer pits 
contained the most contaminated debris, the walls of the feather beds. They also contained nine concrete firing pads reported to be contaminated with up to one and a half kilograms of plutonium and those firing pads seem to have disappeared. There is no mention of them in the government's report of the project. So the government broke their agreement with the South Australian government and the traditional owners. To vitrify the pit contents, a large steel hood some 3 metres high and 11 or 12 metres wide was placed over a pit to be treated. The four graphite electrodes at the top pumped up to 4.5 megawatts of electricity into the debris to melt it and turn it into glass which would isolate the plutonium for perhaps a million years in a 500 ton rock. Melting continued round the clock for about a week. The department were concerned that melting might not reach the bottom of the pit and so some debris might not be encapsulated. So they instructed the contractor to continue melting an additional 30 centimetres. They issued this instruction even though they were simply going to bury the most contaminated items, the walls, which would not be encapsulated at all. As treatment of one pit was nearing completion, something in the pit exploded. The hood was completely destroyed and molten glass was thrown some 50 metres from the pit. The department used this event as an excuse to cancel what their own advisory committee had said was the best way to treat the debris. The ISV equipment was dismantled and thrown into a trench for burial. They then exhumed all the pits, even those that had been vitrified, and buried the whole lot in a trench. And the debris was covered by a couple of sheets of plastic, which was claimed in a Senate hearing to have a life of a few thousand years. To which Senator Lynn Allison responded, A bit of plastic lasts a few thousand years? Fascinating! When the project was complete, the head of the regulatory organisation, Arpanza, said that the project was world's best practice and his view was echoed by the minister responsible for the project. This approach can be compared with the practice in the USA and Britain. The US had carried out the same type of trials as the Vixen B trials at Marolinga but did not use a large steel feather bed. They collected all the contaminated debris from their trials and transported it 300 kilometres by road to a storage area on a guarded site. In Britain, the home of the plutonium at Marolinga, they place plutonium contaminated material in stainless steel drums and store it in an air-conditioned building on a guarded site awaiting transfer to a permanent deep disposal. One wonders why these other countries don't follow the Australian example. Just drop the contaminated material into a bare hole in the ground and save a lot of money. <laughs>